Number 8. William Liskey On October 31st of 2010, teenager Devin Griffin arrived at his mother's home in Benton Township, Ohio, after spending the weekend with his father. Devin only stayed long enough to change his shirt and then left to attend the morning church service. Upon his return, he went to his room and started playing video games, but in the afternoon, noticed that the house was uncharacteristically quiet. He went to check the room shared by his mother, 46-year-old Susan, and stepfather, William Liskey, aged 53. He received no answer upon knocking and entered the room to find them completely under the covers. He tried waking them up but was unsuccessful. Then as he pulled back the comforter, Devon was faced with their dead bodies covered in blood. He was in shock and at first believed the gruesome sight to be a Halloween prank, but then realized the horrific reality. Distraught, he ran out of the house and called an aunt who consequently contacted the authorities. Devon would later learn that his brother Derek, aged 23, had also been murdered in his room. The killer was identified as William Liskey's son and Devon's stepbrother, 24-year-old William B.J. Liskey. He was later arrested at his family's cabin near Sayo. In his teens, Liskey had been diagnosed with a schizoaffective disorder, bipolar type, and had spent time in mental health facilities. He was often in trouble with the authorities and on several occasions had lashed out against his father and stepmother with physical violence. On Halloween, he first went to Derek's room and, as he was sleeping, bludgeoned him to death with both ends of a claw hammer. He then locked the door behind him, heading to Susan and his father's bedroom, where they were both sleeping. He shot William five times in the head and face with a 22 caliber handgun and then shot Susan three times, killing her as well. He also abused his stepmother, but it's unclear if this occurred before or after he'd executed her. The awkward position in which her body was found seemingly supported the latter. Devon would tell investigators that when he'd arrived at the house to change for church, he'd talk to Liskey for a few minutes as he was leaving for the hunting cabin. The teenager would report that his stepbrother seemed to be in a surprisingly talkative and positive mood, which contrasted his usual sullen demeanor. Liskey pleaded guilty to the triple homicide and was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole in 2011. On March the 31st of 2015, he was found dead in his cell. Number 7. Chelsea Bruck In 2014, a 22-year-old woman was killed in the French town township of Michigan. Chelsea Bruck was last seen on October the 26th at a Halloween party where she'd gone dressed as Batman villain Poison Ivy. Roughly six months later, after Bruck's disappearance, her unclothed body was found abandoned in nearby woods. The authorities unequivocally confirmed that she'd been killed by Daniel Clay, a man in his mid-twenties, who was arrested in 2016 based on DNA evidence recovered from Bruck's costume. However, according to his version of events, he'd never meant to kill Bruck. Clay reported that after a night of using drugs and alcohol at the party, he'd spotted her on the road and offered her a ride. He claimed that they then engaged in rough intercourse in his car and that he'd accidentally choked her to death. In court, he would state, I didn't mean for it to end like this. Considering the manner in which he discarded her body, prosecutors argued that his only regret was having been caught. Additionally, there were signs of physical trauma indicating that Bruck had been repeatedly hit in the face. Clay denied attacking her. He was ultimately given a mandatory sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole. Number 6. Rebecca J. Cade Ohio woman Rebecca J. Cade of Chillicothe was brutally murdered in October of 2015, and her remains were at first misidentified as a Halloween decoration. 31-year-old Cade was found hanging by the sleeve of her sweatshirt from a chain-link fence near an electric substation, and contractors working in the area initially believed she was a mannequin. As they got closer and attempted to remove her, they much to their horror realized that they were dealing with human remains. Cade had been bludgeoned, stabbed, and there was a burn mark on her back that had been made through three layers of clothing. Her face featured two stab wounds, each about two inches deep, which had left her unrecognizable, while her neck and torso were covered in additional injuries. She had fought back against her attacker with such desperation that one of her bicep muscles was severed, while the other was nearly torn off. Investigators postulated that she may have tried to climb the fence and flee her attacker before succumbing to her injuries. In the aftermath, 27-year-old Donnie Coconor Jr. was arrested and charged with her murder. A testimony from the man's sister, Lisa Frost, highlighted him as the prime suspect. She claimed that he'd gone to her home about 400 yards from the crime scene to take a shower and that there was blood and mud on his clothes. 
Frost also reported that Cochinor had admitted to having fought with Cade and confessed he might have killed her upon being interrogated. Cochinor told the police that he and Cade had had consensual intercourse on the night of her death and that afterwards there had been an argument between them which escalated into a physical altercation, yet he denied killing her. Coconaut's sister would later reveal to the authorities that she'd lied about her brother's confession, blaming the false testimony on her heroin addiction. Frost reported that the blood on his clothes had been from him being attacked in a separate incident on the night. She spent a year in jail for evidence tampering. Once she got clean, Frost insisted on setting the record straight. In 2017, a jury was initially deadlocked, but eventually, after being asked by the judge to deliberate further, found Coconaut not guilty. Number 5. Christopher Williams and Rebecca Kevin Christopher Williams and his girlfriend Rebecca Kevin, both in their 20s, were attacked on Halloween 2019 while on a romantic getaway to Paris. After spending the night of October the 31st at a party, the British couple began the 10-minute walk back to their hotel in the early hours of the morning. Four Frenchmen in a hatchback of estimated ages ranging from late teens to early 20s pulled up alongside the couple and started harassing Kevin who was wearing a bunny girl costume. Williams, who was dressed as the Grim Reaper, positioned himself between them and his girlfriend. One of the occupants then yanked his arm and pulled it through the open passenger side window. The driver then accelerated and the Liverpool man was dragged roughly 160 feet at over 30 miles per hour up the Rue de la Roquet. He was then dropped and the group proceeded to beat him. He was stomped on, kicked and punched. Kevin chased after them and tried to intervene, at which point she was also struck in the face repeatedly. The three-minute long attack was broken up as pedestrians gathered on the street. Both Williams and Kevin had sustained broken noses and heavy facial bruising. In what the couple described as a genuine Halloween nightmare, Williams was also left with a chipped tooth, while Kevin suffered a fractured finger. They reported the assault to the police, but it's unclear what arrests were made in the aftermath. Number 4. Madrid Arena Stampede in 2012, a deadly stampede occurred during a Halloween party at the Madrid Arena, resulting in the death of five female attendees, all of whom were in the late teens and early 20s. Panic had overtaken the crowd, which had gathered at the venue during an event called Thriller Music Park, headlined by DJ Steve Aoki. The cause wasn't immediately identified, but it was later reported that the crush had been triggered by a flare being set off. It didn't take place on the dance floor, but in a passage of terror on a lower level, which was connected to the main floor via a stairwell. In the panic-driven chaos, concert goers trampled each other in the narrow passageway. Roughly 50 medical personnel were called to the venue at around 4 a.m. Two of the victims succumbed to cardiac arrest at the scene, while the other three passed away at the hospital. It took the authorities three hours following the incident to clear the arena. In the tragedy's aftermath, the event's promoter was given a four-year jail term for negligent homicide after it emerged that 17,000 tickets had been sold, while the arena had been authorized to admit entry to only 10,600 people. Number 3. Carl Girard On Halloween 2020, in what local authorities described as a night of horror, a man dressed in a medieval costume carried out a mass stabbing in Quebec City, Canada. The attacker was 24-year-old Carl Girard, and by all accounts he'd chosen his victims at random. Girard didn't have a criminal record and his motives remained unclear, but it was reported that he had a history of mental illness and that he'd threatened violence against others in the past. He wasn't a resident of the city and, according to Quebec City Police Chief Robert Pigeon, had traveled there with the express intention of doing the most damage possible. Armed with a katana-like sword, he carried out attacks at four different locations. 61-year-old Suzanne Clermont and Francois Deschain aged 56 were killed while five others were injured. One of the victims was butchered extensively and exhibited a piercing wound that went through the upper torso. Survivors had severe lacerations but were deemed to be outside mortal danger. Girard's rampage lasted for over two hours before he was apprehended without incident as he was found barefoot and lying on the ground, exhibiting signs of hypothermia. From his car, the police retrieved multiple gasoline containers. In the wake of his rampage, he was charged with two counts of first-degree murder and five counts of attempted murder. Number 2. Shooting at Long Beach House 
On October the 29th of 2019, a gang-related shooting occurred at a Halloween-themed party in Long Beach, California. Chan Chenda Hao, the man who rented the single-story home near Temple Avenue, would later tell investigators that the party was hosted by his son for one of his co-workers. Around 30 people were in attendance when gunfire erupted and a hail of bullets descended upon the property's backyard. 35-year-old Melvin Williams II, along with Morris Poe Jr. and Ricardo Torres, both in their 20s, were pronounced dead at the scene. Nine others were injured. Howe's son, Daniel Chan, reported hearing a man dressed in all black shout out, Are you prepared to die tonight? and then fleeing the scene about an hour before the shooting commenced. It would later emerge that a Long Beach gang had misidentified the Halloween party as one put together by their rivals. Contrasting their beliefs, none of the guests had any known criminal affiliations. Initially, the investigation had limited leads, but by 2020, a dozen suspects were arrested, several of whom were charged with murder. As the active gunmen, they traveled in three SUVs from North Long Beach and shot the gathering from an alley adjacent to the property in the 2700 block of East 7th Street. Number 1. Carly Ray Barron On Halloween night 2020, a verbal altercation escalated dramatically and resulted in the shooting of a young woman in Wilmington, North Carolina. Officers were investigating a noise complaint in the area, and they conversed at a 3600 block of Wrightsville Avenue upon hearing the sound of gunfire. After a traffic collision, 21-year-old Jaquan Cortez Jackson was arguing with a group of which 23-year-old Carly Ray Barron is believed to have been a part. Jackson discharged a firearm during the dispute and struck Barron, inflicting critical injuries. Arriving officers saw a vehicle speeding away. One member of law enforcement attempted to save the life of the victim, while the other pursued Jackson, who was stopped and detained. Barron was later pronounced dead at a local hospital. Jackson was charged with second-degree murder and held at the New Hanover County Jail under a $750,000 secured bond. Number 9. Holly Matthews and Jonathan Sebaeus just before 12.40 a.m. on October the 31st of 2021, a shooting was reported at a Halloween party in the Joliet Township of Illinois. What had been planned as a small gathering in the backyard of a house in East Jackson Street swelled to over 200 people after news of it had circulated on social media. The party was thrust into chaos when two men sitting on the balcony opened fire on the crowd. Over a dozen people, which included attendees and others from neighboring houses, were injured after being caught in the hail of bullets. 22-year-old Holly Matthews and two female friends had briefly stopped at the party after attending another event and were about to leave. The woman had recently gotten engaged and was studying to become an arborist at Joliet Junior College. She was fatally struck by gunfire while on her way out of the home. Also shot dead was 22-year-old Jonathan Sebaeus. As of January the 6th of 2022, three suspects had been taken into custody in connection to the shooting on charges of first-degree murder, attempted first-degree murder, and various weapons offenses. They were identified as 18-year-old Joscar S. Ramos, along with brothers Thomas and Jeremy Lopez, aged 21 and 19 respectively. Ramos was the first to be arrested on November the 5th, and the deputy reported that he'd seen him try to hide a gun on the roof of his Joliet home prior to being taken into custody. The Lopez brothers were known to Will County officials as Vice Lord gang members with multiple past weapons charges. As reported by survivors of the shooting, it could have potentially been avoided if the police had responded to earlier reports of the party getting out of control. Number 8. Alexis Cantu In late October of 2021, teenager Alexis Cantu went to a Halloween party in North Houston, Texas. The 18-year-old identified as the daughter of a Harris County Department of Education Board of Trustee was at a home in the 1900 block of Shilda Drive to attend what was described as a jam-packed gathering. At some point during the party, an argument broke out between two groups of teenagers. In one of the videos taken at the scene, one attendee was heard saying, Oh, they're fighting moments before gunshots rang out. Footage would show partygoers fleeing or trying to find cover. Before the authorities were called to the scene, Cantu was shot dead but it wasn't made immediately clear if she'd been targeted or struck by a stray bullet. 
Three other teens were treated for non-fatal injuries, but most of the attendees had run away by the time the police arrived at the scene. Officers found bullets that had gone through the back of the home. A further search of the premises led to the discovery of a weapon in a ditch near the residence and police deduced that at least another firearm had been used in the shootout. No arrests were made in the immediate aftermath, but the authorities did report that they were looking at a potential suspect whom they didn't name. Number 7. Kennedy Family Law enforcement in Friendswood, Texas responded to multiple complaints over a Halloween party in 2015. Neighbors had called to report noise, underage drinking, and that several vehicles were blocking the roadway. The police talked to homeowners, Gregory and Kelly Kennedy, at around 10 p.m., and they agreed to end the party hosted by their teenage daughter, Delaney. The couple maintained that no alcohol was present on the premises, either due to the Kennedys' unwillingness or inability to control the gathering the party raged on, reportedly becoming even louder than before. When the police returned to the property, they found over a hundred attendees, mainly teens, walking around with beer bottles in their hands. As officers sorted through the large group, several teens tried to flee by jumping into a flooded creek, resulting in a search and rescue operation. Four of them were found and taken into custody for evading arrest. Delaney, who still had her Halloween makeup on, in her booking photo, was charged with violating the open party ordinance. Kelly and Gregory, both aged 56, were given the same charge in addition to furnishing alcohol to minors. In spite of the evidence, the former would later tell a radio station, I did not have a booze party for a bunch of teenagers, noting that when planning the event, she'd insisted that alcohol wouldn't be tolerated. Number 6 the Bearded Kitten and Sugar House Gang. A private party in Hackney, North London, was swarmed by police units at Halloween in 2008, and its organizers were taken into custody under suspicion of violating an act aimed at extremist groups. The collective responsible for putting together the event called themselves the Bearded Kitten Sugar House Gang and had earned a cult following for their subversive gatherings and live events. For the party, They'd decided on a mad scientist theme. They wore wigs and lab coats while using chemistry sets to conduct several theatrical experiments to entertain their guests. Acne police entered the building for a routine check on Sunday morning during the Halloween weekend and found the scientific equipment. Law enforcement suspected the organizers of manufacturing drugs or explosives and started arresting them. The road was cordoned off while multiple fire engines, ambulances and police cars were called to the scene. Property caretaker Richard Watson, aged 29, initially laughed upon being told that he was being taken into custody on suspicion of making bombs, but then realized that the police was fully committed in their intentions. Watson, who was later released without charge, stated that he understood the pressure that the authorities were placed under when dealing with such threats, but noted that the substances used in the experiments largely consisted of food coloring, bicarbonate of soda and vinegar. 27-year-old Timmy Sampson, one of the mad scientists taking part in the experiments, thought that the police response was a bit presumptuous given that it was Halloween. Updates suggested that none of the organizers were charged. Number 5. Patrick Galway A Florida man in an inflatable dinosaur suit choked his girlfriend in late October of 2018 because she wouldn't go to a Halloween party with him. 19-year-old Patrick Galway was in a T-Rex costume when he demanded that his 23-year-old girlfriend, whose identity wasn't released, accompany him to the gathering at his friend's home. Galway became enraged when the woman refused by saying that she'd rather watch a movie with her friends. The Port St. Lucie man charged and took her to the ground, mounted her, and then pushed her neck into the floor of his home. The victim called 911 in the aftermath, and Galway was arrested at around 2.45 a.m. When he returned home from the party, on the passenger side of his vehicle, the police found the inflatable dinosaur suit. Number 4. Kindergarten Clown Incident a clip of an ill-fated Halloween stunt at a U.S. gymnasium went viral in 2021 and showed a man dressed as Pennywise the Clown 
from the horror movie It getting beaten up by a group of kindergartners. The clip originally featured on world star hip-hop began with the man walking into the gymnasium while waving his arms and trying to scare the children, many of whom were wearing costumes of their own. Screams collectively echoed through the gymnasium as the clown approached a kindergartner from behind. Moments later, a child launched himself at him and dragged him to the ground by his neck. Other kindergartners joined in the charge and started raining down fists on the downed man, while also forcefully ripping off his red wig. None of the adults in the gymnasium intervened and chose to continue filming the incident. The children eventually ceased their onslaught and the clown stumbled back to his feet. Some of those commenting on the 24-second viral video complimented the children's bravery in reacting to what they presumably thought was a killer clown. Others approached the footage with humor, as one user wrote, shortest horror movie in history. Number 3. Gatsby Randolph In October of 2018, law enforcement in Beverly Hills was called to a Halloween party hosted by George Clooney after an actor was allegedly attacked by a former reality TV star and her friend. Gatsby Randolph reported that he was involved in an altercation with 45-year-old Brandy Glanville and her unnamed female friend, whom Randolph reportedly used to date. Pictures taken at the scene showed the actor with a bloodied lip and Glanville, a former Real Housewives of Beverly Hills star, clad in a revealing cat costume while being escorted by an officer. Randolph told a media outlet in the aftermath that Glanville and her friend attacked him with 12 uppercuts and compared the incident to a boxing match. The former Real Housewives star, however, maintained that she'd been merely trying to break up the argument between Randolph and her friend. No arrests were made at the scene, but the former did file a police report for battery. In late October of 2017, Randall Jones was hosting a Halloween party at his home on Avenue F in the North Loop neighborhood of Austin, Texas. The 32-year-old had become heavily intoxicated and increasingly enraged when guests told him he should either calm down or go to bed. Jones, who at the time was wearing a Santa Claus costume, emerged with a 40 caliber revolver. He shot one bullet into the floor, prompting most of his guests to scatter and frantically look for cover. 37-year-old attendee Michael McCloskey charged the homeowner and tried to wrestle the firearm away from him. Unfortunately, McCloskey's brave intervention ended with him being repeatedly shot by Jones and sustaining fatal injuries. Jones fired several more times, leaving two other guests with non-fatal wounds. He was arrested at his home and, in 2019, pleaded guilty to one count of murder and two counts of aggravated assault. He testified that he didn't remember the shooting and characterized his actions as those of a child, throwing a tantrum upon not getting his way. A judge ultimately sentenced him to 40 years in prison, and he'd have to serve at least half of his sentence before being eligible for parole. Number 7. The Carnation Murders The Anderson family of Carnation, Washington, was attacked on Christmas Eve 2007 while preparing for their holiday party. King County police officers were dispatched to the home of Wayne and Judy Anderson following a mysterious 911 call made by someone inside the house. The caller neglected to identify themselves and immediately hung up after dispatchers heard what sounded like some sort of argument in the background. When deputies arrived at the scene, they were unable to gain access to the residence due to a locked front gate. Rather than investigate further, the officers left. Two days later, Judy Anderson's friend and co-worker, Linda Thiel, went to the home to check on Judy as she'd been absent from work. Thiel peered through the window and saw multiple bodies on the floor. She called 911 to report her findings, and King County officers were sent to the Andersons' home. It was on that second dispatchment to the property that six dead bodies were discovered inside the residence. The victims were identified as Wayne and Judy Anderson, their son and daughter-in-law, and their two grandchildren. While detectives were investigating the crime scene, the Andersons' 29-year-old daughter Michelle and her boyfriend, Joseph McEnroe, drove up to the house and were subsequently taken in for questioning by the police. The pair would later admit to murdering Michelle's family members. According to subsequent testimony, the victims were shot a combined 14 times by the two killers, who reportedly showed up to the house on the afternoon of December the 24th of 2007. Michelle's parents, Wayne and Judy, were the first to have been gunned down. The other four victims were killed 
after they'd arrived at the house a short while later. Michelle's sister-in-law, Erica, was able to get a hold of the home's cordless phone and dial 911 before succumbing to her wounds. McEnroe quickly destroyed the phone and removed its batteries, which accounted for the call's abrupt disconnection that had previously puzzled the emergency dispatchers. The two perpetrators were ultimately convicted on multiple counts of first-degree murder and were both sentenced to life in prison. Number 6. Nickel Perkins A 24-year-old Texas woman was shot dead in the early morning hours of December the 22nd of 2019. Nickel Perkins had been attending a holiday party for the horseback trail riding group of which she was a part called the Buck Wild Gang. Just before 3 a.m., Dallas County authorities were called to the dance hall in Oak Cliff, where the party had taken place. After receiving reports of shots fired on the premises, upon their arrival, officers discovered that a woman later identified as Perkins had suffered gunshot wounds that would ultimately prove fatal. She was pronounced dead at the scene. Reportedly, an argument had flared up in the parking lot of the dance hall after the party had ended. There was a large crowd of people gathered outside when the situation suddenly escalated into a gunfight. The police were told by witnesses at the scene that multiple individuals had begun firing at each other, and Perkins, who was not involved in the dispute, was unfortunately caught in the crossfire. Investigators were unable to positively identify any suspects in the deadly shooting, and as of the case's latest updates, there had been no arrests made. A former three-sport athlete at Ennis High School, Perkins had worked as a medical provider at Baylor Scott & White Health prior to her untimely passing. 34-year-old Samina Imam of Cardiff, Wales, was murdered by her lover and his brother on December 24, 2014. Imam, a marketing manager at Costco, had previously struck up a relationship with a co-worker named Roger Cooper, aged 39. Cooper was also married at the time and had a total of three romantic partners, including Imam. After Imam had given him an ultimatum to leave his wife and make their relationship public, Cooper put together a plan to kill his mistress in order to keep her from divulging the details of their two-year affair. He enlisted the help of his brother David, an ex-soldier. After months of preparation, the murderous plot was finally set into motion on Christmas Eve 2014. In the evening, Cooper brought Imam to David's home in Leicester, England after work. David subsequently overpowered the victim on his sofa, smothering her with a chloroform-soaked rag. The brothers immediately disposed of her body, burying it in an allotment with the help of a friend. Imam was reported missing by her family after she'd failed to return home for Christmas. Her whereabouts had been unknown until her body was found on January the 4th of 2015. Roger and David Cooper were arrested three days later and eventually admitted to carrying out the murder. The brothers had covertly communicated with each other through Star Wars-themed texts, exchanging messages like, Death Star complete and stay on target. You are expected, Vader, to conceal the true nature of their plans. They were both found guilty of Imam's murder and were given prison sentences of 30 years each. Number 3. Caroli Taylor On December 24, 2019, Houston woman Caroli Taylor was killed by her ex-boyfriend during a family get-together that was celebrating her 46th birthday. The party took place at the home of Taylor's uncle, Dominique Ortiz. The family had just finished singing Happy Birthday to Taylor when Ortiz noticed a black jeep pull up in front of the residence. Taylor's ex-partner, 52-year-old Albert Simon, emerged from the vehicle carrying a long barrel firearm. As Simon approached the house, Ortiz went outside to confront him. The homeowner would later tell police that Simon then forced his way inside the home and demanded Taylor go with him on a walk. He threatened the woman and her family with violence if she refused, so she agreed to step outside. Not long after the two had left the house, Simon fired five rounds at his ex-girlfriend, killing her instantly. The gunman fled the scene and was on the run for roughly four days before he was ultimately caught by police at Herman Park. He was shot dead by Houston officers after reaching inside his bag. Taylor had reportedly ended her relationship with Simon just a week prior to her murder. Hours before the party, she had received multiple threatening texts from the man who would eventually end her life. She was survived by a daughter named Maya. Number 2. Alexis Valdez An 18-year-old Chicago resident decapitated his aunt's boyfriend and proceeded to give his severed head to her as a present on Christmas Day of 2013. Alexis Valdez had previously moved in with his aunt and her partner, 41-year-old Silvestre Diaz Hernandez, under several conditions that included 
him going to school, holding a steady job, and helping pay for household bills. In the months leading up to the gruesome incident, Valdez had stopped holding up his end of the agreed-upon bargain. He was no longer attending school and had quit his job, prompting his aunt to request that he move out. A disgruntled Valdez then made plans to murder Diaz Hernandez as a form of revenge towards his aunt. The teenager would later disclose to investigators that he assaulted his aunt's boyfriend with a hammer, leaving a hole in his skull. When the victim was dead, Valdez then mutilated his corpse. He removed the eyes, nose, and ears from Diaz Hernandez's head, then separated the head from the rest of his body. He placed the severed body part on his aunt's bed, later telling police he wanted to leave her a present for Christmas. Valdez then called 911 and told dispatchers of the dead body. When emergency responders asked if he had attempted CPR, Valdez simply laughed off the question and revealed that the body had been decapitated. When officers arrived at the scene, they found the perpetrator covered in blood. In February of 2017, Valdez pleaded guilty to first-degree murder and was sentenced to 33 years in prison. Number 1. The Covina Massacre in 2008, a man dressed as Santa Claus showed up at a Christmas Eve party in Covina, California and viciously murdered nine people, including his ex-wife. The perpetrator was later revealed as Bruce Pardo, aged 45, whose divorce had been finalized only a week prior to the incident. At around 11.30 p.m., Pardo knocked on the front door of his former in-law's house while donning a Santa costume and holding a gift-wrapped package. A party attended by roughly 25 people was taking place inside the home. When the door was opened, Pardo forced his way in and pulled out multiple 9mm handguns from inside the box. He began firing indiscriminately at the horrified house guests who fled to different parts of the home. One survivor managed to escape to a next-door neighbor's house and contact the police. Investigators would later determine that Pardo had likely murdered some of his victims, execution style at point-blank range. After Pardo had finished shooting, he further unwrapped the package to reveal a rolling air compressor that had been rigged to spray gasoline. Once the gas had been disseminated thoroughly, he set the house on fire. The resulting blaze reportedly rose up to 50 feet in the air. It took 90 minutes for 80 firefighters to finally put out the flames. After igniting the fire, Pardo changed into street clothes and drove to his brother's house 30 miles away. He would later take his own life by way of a self-inflicted gunshot to the head. Police theorized that Pardo's initial plan was to flee the state after carrying out the attack. However, after suffering third-degree burns from the house fire, some of which had resulted in the suit melting into his skin, he changed his plans. Among those murdered during the massacre was Pardo's ex-wife, Sylvia. Investigators have speculated that the couple's marital problems likely served as the primary motive for the crime. Number 8. Melissa Young In the summer of 2013, transgender woman Melissa Young locked her neighbor 47-year-old Alan Williamson in her apartment in Edinburgh, Scotland. She threatened him with a knife, leaving the man so terrified that he jumped from her first-floor balcony to escape. Roughly six months after the incident, on Christmas Day, Young offered him gifts consisting of sneakers and a copy of The Sun newspaper's 2014 calendar. Williamson refused them, to which Young reacted by frantically stabbing him nearly 30 times. When the police arrived at her apartment, they found her with bloody hands and Williamson dead behind her front door. Following her arrest, Young claimed to have seen a bright light and heard voices before she flipped and knifed her neighbor to death. The woman, who had a tattoo of the Virgin Mary on one arm, and a tattoo of Lucifer on the other claimed that the archangel Saint Michael had taken control of her body. She maintained to have been used as an instrument of God to punish the unclean demon. Young also claimed that she wouldn't have stabbed Williamson had he accepted her gifts. She denied murder but admitted to killing him on the grounds of abnormality of mind. It was determined that she suffered from a severe personality disorder, but the Crown rejected that it had played a part in Williamson's murder. She was jailed for life with a minimum of 20 years served. In August of 2014, as Young launched an appeal against the murder conviction, her former boss revealed that he'd had to fire her roughly a decade before the incident and offered further insight into her troubled mind. The man had run a private sauna under the name Shear and revealed he'd had to terminate Young as she had stolen clients by offering her own escort services. He noted that at six feet three inches tall, her towering presence 
intimidated the other workers with whom she'd often clash. Shear described her as being like a tiger who could lash out at any moment after she was fired. Young's erratic behavior continued until her arrest for murder. She kept working as an escort, struggled with addiction, became a serial shoplifter, and developed a fixation for the Catholic Church, frantically writing letters to the Pope and religious leaders in Scotland. Number 7. Herbert Jones A female teenager called the police in Hanover, Massachusetts, following an incident at the Hanover Mall at the beginning of the Christmas season in 2013. The 18-year-old, who chose not to reveal her identity, had been dressed as an elf while working alongside Herbert Jones, who was wearing a Santa Claus costume. They'd been employed by Cherry Hill Photos, with the teenager taking pictures of children as they sat with 62-year-old Jones, whose fit for Father Christmas was aided by his natural, bushy white beard. At some point during the day, however, Jones reportedly pinched the teenager's backside, telling her, I wish you were a few years older and I was younger. It prompted her to alert the authorities, as he was taken into custody from the dressing room, Jones denied having intentionally touched the teen, claiming she'd actually been the one who'd bumped into him. As reported by a wicked local, their manager had told the police that the elf-costumed worker had been in a bad mood after being questioned over some missing money earlier in the day, possibly supporting Jones's version of events. He subsequently pleaded not guilty to indecent assault and battery and was released on a $1,000 bail. A judge ordered him to stay away from the mall where he'd previously been employed and also banned him from playing Santa Claus for the rest of the season. Number 6. Madison Hansen On Christmas Day 2021, Law enforcement in Seward County, Nebraska, attempted to stop a vehicle that had no license plates while speeding in an area where the limit was 75 miles per hour. Instead of pulling over, 20-year-old Madison Hansen continued westbound, accelerating to nearly 120 miles per hour before exiting the highway. The high-speed chase ended when the young Lincoln resident brought her vehicle to a stop near Agnew Road. Her blood alcohol was tested by law enforcement and found to have been over the limit, resulting in a charge of DUI, in addition to a multitude of other charges. They included felony operating a motor vehicle to avoid arrest, willful reckless driving, and operating while license suspended. Number 5. Santa Claus Protest Incident a man dressed as Santa Claus was arrested by British police at around Christmas in 2021 while he was trying to handcuff himself to the UK Parliament in London. The incident occurred as thousands had gathered in the capital to protest the recent COVID-19 measures, particularly the introduction of vaccination passports for large venues. A video of the arrest went viral in the aftermath and it showed roughly a dozen police officers as they struggled to subdue the unnamed man. As they were doing so, a voice was heard berating them off camera shouting, You're gonna be on the wrong side of the history, you lot, you traitors! The Santa Claus protesters' beard and hat were removed in the struggle and he was eventually placed in the back of a police van. It wasn't clear if he was charged with anything, but while some of the online reactions were sympathetic to his cause, most users had tongue-in-cheek comments regarding the arrest. One claimed, the Christmas was cancelled while others jokingly asked if they'd still be getting their presents. Number 4. Holly Aliff On December the 24th of 2021, Holly Aliff walked into the Journey store at the Prescott Gateway Mall in Arizona and asked employees to set aside several pairs of shoes for her. The woman claimed that she had to wait for her husband to come and pay for the items. Less than an hour later, she returned to the store with a pistol in hand. She held the employees at gunpoint, first demanding cash from the register and then ordering them to place the money and shoes in the trunk of her car. After Aliff had driven off, staff called 911 and gave responding officers a description of her vehicle. The police subsequently located it in the downtown area. The woman admitted her involvement in the incident and was taken into custody. A handgun was found in the vehicle while Law enforcement also recovered what she'd stolen, consisting of over $3,700 in cash and $1,500 in shoes. Aliff was booked into Yavapai County Jail on charges of kidnapping, aggravated assault, and armed robbery. 
Number three, Patty Michelle White. When Florida woman Michelle O'Dowd failed to show up for work at around Christmas time in 2011, her twin brother, Phil Axt, went to check on her. The man found that her home in Jacksonville's Southside neighborhood had been ransacked. He then saw a foot sticking out of a pile of Christmas presents meant for the woman's nieces, nephews, and grandchildren. I grabbed her ankle and it was cold, Axt would later recall. 67-year-old O'Dowd had been fatally beaten and strangled before the killer had piled gifts on top of her body and covered her bloodied face with a towel. A few days after the gruesome discovery, the police tracked down and arrested 37-year-old Patty Michelle White in South Carolina. She was a family friend and the former girlfriend of O'Dowd's nephew. The older woman had opened up her home to White a few months prior, after she'd fallen on hard times. To help her with money, she and Axt used to pay her to clean houses, babysit, or do various other jobs. O'Dowd had even trusted White with the PIN numbers for her debit and credit cards so that she could do grocery shopping for both of them. In the murder's aftermath, White was captured by surveillance cameras using one of the cards to withdraw $1,000 at two ATMs in Florida. O'Dowd's family members recognized her from the footage. Investigators believe that after living in South Carolina for several months, White had returned to Jacksonville with the intention of robbing O'Dowd. Something then went wrong inside the home that resulted in the latter being killed. In further comments on the incident, the elderly woman's brother stated, How can you be so sick to bury the victim with children's gifts? White confessed after she was arrested and in 2013 pleaded guilty to second-degree murder. She received a prison sentence of 45 years. Number 2. Henrietta Bush In 2019, an Ohio resident was arrested for beating a woman in the Avondale neighborhood of Cincinnati. The connection, if any, between 32-year-old Henrietta Bush and the victim, Rhonda Lewis, wasn't reported. The brutal attack was launched on Christmas Day in the immediate aftermath of Lewis wishing the other woman a Merry Christmas. Bush repeatedly punched her in the head, inflicting what was reported as visible physical harm. She was booked into the Hamilton County Jail on a $10,000 bond and scheduled to be arraigned in early January of the following year. She had a lengthy criminal record, which included, among others, assault, theft, menacing, and narcotics possession. Number 1. Downtown Posse In December of 1992, the town of Dayton, Ohio was in the midst of Christmas preparations when it came under attack by a violent gang of young adults. The group consisted of locals who called themselves the Downtown Posse under the reported leadership of 19-year-old Marvelous Keen. Joining him were his girlfriend, teenager Laura Taylor, 19-year-old Demarcus Maurice Smith and his girlfriend, Heather Nicole Matthews, aged 20. All four of them were estranged from their families when they started spending time together and their influence on each other would produce the deadliest killing spree in the town's history. On Christmas Eve, Taylor and Matthews convinced General Motors worker Joseph Wilkerson that they'd have relations with him at his home. He was ambushed and executed when they reached the property. The gang spent the following three days in his home while his dead body lay in the bedroom. Their next victim was 18-year-old Danita Goulet, whom they robbed at a phone booth in town. Even though the mother of one had given them her shoes, jacket, and book bag, they still shot her dead. On Christmas Day, the body of 19-year-old Richard Maddox was found in his car. He'd been fatally shot in the head by the gang, and the police later found that he'd once dated Taylor. That same day, the posse targeted Jeffrey Wright outside a home on Yuma Place. They shot him four times, but he ultimately survived. On December the 26th, the four spree killers gunned down 38-year-old mother, Sarah Abraham, who was working at the family-run shortstop mini-mart. Abraham succumbed to her injuries five days later. A customer was shot, but later recovered while another worker avoided injury by pretending to be dead. Dayton homicide detectives didn't realize the crimes were connected at first and struggled with identifying suspects. It was only after a carjacking carried out by the posse in which the victim was able to escape that they caught a break. Police stopped the gang as they were driving around in the stolen vehicle but had no idea at the time they were the spree killers. 
The four cooperated with the arresting officer. It was later revealed that Taylor had told Keane to shoot him, but he refused. A vehicle they'd abandoned nearby led the police to Wilkerson's home, where they found his rotting body tied to the bed. With the posse behind bars, Taylor was visited by a local minister and confessed that the gang had claimed two more victims. The bodies of teenagers Wendy Cottrell and Marvin Washington were found in a city-owned gravel pit. The gang had killed them for fear that they'd report their activity to the police in the aftermath. Keane was sentenced to death and after 17 years of appeals, he was executed in 2009. His three accomplices were given life sentences. Number 7. Faster Horses Incident In July of 2021, three young men were found dead in a camping trailer while attending the Faster Horses Music Festival in Michigan. The event, which takes place at the Michigan International Speedway, is also known as the three-day hillbilly sleepover, as most festival goers will typically camp in and around the racetrack. After a concerned friend of the group had called the emergency services, first responders arrived at the scene and opened the camping trailer to find five men, all of whom were unconscious. Dawson Brown and Richie Mays II, both aged 20, were pronounced dead at the scene, as was 19-year-old Cole Silva. All three were Michigan Center High School graduates who'd played on the same football team. 20-year-olds Rayfield Johnson and Curtis Stitt were taken to the hospital in critical condition but ultimately survived in what Lenawi County Sheriff Troy Bevier deemed to have been an absolutely tragic event. It was determined that the men had suffered from carbon monoxide poisoning. They hadn't properly stored a generator they'd been using, which resulted in them inhaling the deadly fumes. In the aftermath, Sheriff Bevier issued a warning to people using generators, urging them to make sure such devices were kept in a well-ventilated area. Number 6. Michaela Hostetler After she'd attended the 2018 edition of the Faster Horses Festival in Michigan, a young woman was fatally struck by an SUV. On July the 23rd, Michaela Hostetler, aged 19, was walking on the shoulder of the road near the Michigan International Speedway alongside her boyfriend, 21-year-old Colin Campbell. Even though the festival had just ended, a number of attendees were reportedly heading to after-parties. Shortly after 4 a.m., 17-year-old Jose Mora was driving his 2005 Chevrolet Trailblazer north on Brooklyn Highway. By his account, Mora glanced at his gear shift and only peripherally spotted the couple before plowing into them. He denied that he'd been looking at his phone prior to the collision, although a test revealed it had been used seven times between 4.10 and 4.20 a.m., a timeline corresponding to that in which the accident was suspected to have occurred. Hostetler sustained mortal injuries while Campbell was left in critical condition. He had no recollection of the crash after sustaining traumatic brain injuries for which he spent considerable time at an inpatient rehabilitation center. There were no charges filed against Mora as prosecutors deemed there wasn't enough evidence to pursue a criminal case. At the time of the accident, he was under the limit for alcohol consumption and there was no irrefutable indication of moving violations or distracted driving. Number 5. Luella Fletcher Michi An hour before her 25th birthday on September the 10th of 2017, a woman died in the woods at the edge of the Bestival Music Festival in Dorset, England. Luella Fletcher Michi, daughter of Scottish film and television actor John Michi, was attending the festival with her boyfriend, Sion Brufton, aged 28. The aspiring rapper had reportedly procured the recreational drug 2CP, classified as a Class A substance, and given it to Fletcher Michi. He then filmed her over a period of six hours as she began to hallucinate on the drug and beg for help, leading up to her death. At various moments in the harrowing footage, Fletcher Michi tried eating thorns and had begun to slap herself in an evident state of confusion, with Brufton at one point calling her a drama queen. In spite of her being in distress, Brufton didn't take her to the festival's hospital tent, even though they were only several hundred yards from it. Prosecutors would later argue that it was because he feared repercussions, stemming from a suspended prison sentence he'd been given about a month prior. Fletcher Michi began shouting for her parents and eventually talked to them on the phone. They immediately began the 120-mile drive from London to Dorset but unfortunately arrived too late to find her alive. It was subsequently argued that she was already dead at Brufton's feet in the last video he'd taken of her. He was arrested but defended his actions by claiming 
that he didn't want to leave Fletcher Mitchie alone in the woods to get help and that he only thought she was having a bad trip. He was found guilty of manslaughter by gross negligence in February of 2019. His eight and a half year prison sentence was overturned on appeal and only a drug charge remained. As a judge determined, prosecutors had failed to prove that Fletcher Mitchie would have survived had she received help. Number 4. Isabella Simetta Texas teenager Isabella Simetta suffered a fatal gunshot wound to her abdomen while at a renaissance fair on October the 25th of 2020. The authorities responded to reports of a disturbance at the Texas Renaissance Festival campgrounds in Todd Mission at around 2.40 a.m. 19-year-old Simetta and Sean Campbell, aged 22, were acquaintances who traveled to the festival along with other friends. Another attendee, Mitchell Heasley, told investigators that he and Simetta had gotten into an argument. Campbell then intervened and put a gun to Heasley's head. According to a probable cause affidavit, an altercation ensued with the former attempting to disarm Campbell. During the struggle, the weapon discharged and a round struck Simetta, who later passed away. Campbell fled the scene but was later found in a car with a 6-hour 9mm handgun in the glove compartment. He admitted to firing the shot that killed Simetta and was held at Grimes County Jail on two counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Number 3. Astro World Crush On November the 5th of 2021, a massive human crush occurred at the Energy Park in Houston, Texas. During a performance by rapper Travis Scott, on the first day of the Astro World Festival. Eight people died on the night of the concert and two more passed away from their injuries over the following days, while at least 25 were hospitalized. Live Nation, along with its affiliates, operated and managed the disastrous event, which was also streamed live by Apple Music. Since the morning hours before the scheduled opening, groups had begun breaching checkpoints and flooding the venue. As noted by the Houston Police Department, volatile crowd behavior continued into the evening with hundreds being treated at the festival's aid stations. There was no act on the festival's second stage, therefore the estimated 50,000 in attendance all assembled outside the main stage to watch Scott, who was also the festival's founder, as he began his performance at 9.02 p.m. Houston Fire Chief Sam Pena would later tell the media that the crowd began to compress towards the front of the stage, while also surging from the sides and the concert rapidly devolved into chaos. Concert goers began falling and trampling over each other. Multiple sources, including forensic analysis and video evidence, indicated that at least one attendee was fatally crushed under a mass of people right at the concert's onset, with no evidence he ever got up again. Ten minutes into Scott's performance, a tightly packed group of fans in the crowd's southern quadrant began screaming for help. Those who died or suffered critical injuries are believed to have suffered compressive asphyxiation after being forced into as little as 1.85 square feet of space per person. Medical personnel couldn't reach those in need as piles of fans were nearly two-person deep in some areas. In the pandemonium, there were instances of unconscious fans being crowd-surfed to safety. Many had started chanting for the show to be stopped while one woman was filmed climbing a ladder to the media tower and pleading for help from camera operators. A man joined her shouting, people are dying, while elsewhere in the crowd fans had started dancing on top of ambulances, fruitlessly trying to get through. Scott had paused his performance a total of three times throughout, once to report that someone had passed out, but continued singing after each one, encouraging more fervent reactions from his fans. The concert ended at 10.12 and gained widespread notoriety in the aftermath. The investigation is ongoing, but a number of lawsuits have already been launched against Scott and the festival's operators. While there had been considerable problems with the festival's overall organization, the rapper himself was also heavily criticized for not stopping the concert or attempting to better control the crowd. Number 2. Alexandra Ross King In January of 2019, a young Australian woman died of an MDMA overdose at the FOMO Music Festival in Parramatta Park. While heading to the event, 19-year-old Alexandra Ross King and her friends had stopped in Gosford, where they bought drugs from a local dealer. They then took a bus to the festival held in the western part of Sydney. B 
because drinks at the event were so expensive the group decided to arrive already drunk and consumed juice mixed with vodka on the way. In about half an hour, Ross King took roughly three quarters of an MDMA capsule, which she washed down with alcohol. Before entering the FOMO festival, she ingested two more capsules at once, nervous that the police might find the drugs on her. She spent the next few hours dancing as temperatures climbed up to 95 degrees Fahrenheit and drinking vodka mixed with Red Bull. She then began to feel unwell and her friends helped her to a medical tent, where she began to suffer from muscle spasms, high fever and irregular breathing. The teenager was rushed to Westmead Hospital where she suffered multiple cardiac arrests and ultimately passed away. Two unnamed men aged 20 and 23 were arrested in the aftermath by Gosford police for indirectly supplying the drugs that had claimed Ross King's life. Number 1. Mawazine Stampede Shortly after midnight on May the 24th of 2009, a deadly stampede occurred at a soccer stadium in Rabat, Morocco, during the Mawazine International Music Festival. A free concert by pop star Abdelaziz Stati had begun later than billed, allowing festival attendees who had finished concerts at other locations to make their way to the Hay Nada Stadium. The stampede occurred towards the end of the performance, when many of the 70,000 in attendance tried to leave the stadium at the same time. A wire fence collapsed as the enormous mass of people began overflowing out of the venue. Eleven concert goers died with their bodies only discovered after the stampede had ended, and at least as many were hospitalized. Rescuers subsequently had to pull survivors from the wreckage. The governor of Rabat at the time blamed the tragedy on the concert goers, claiming they decided to go over the metal barriers to have a quick exit. However, survivors questioned why the exits had been shut, even though it was a free concert, and why the police officers at the scene, which numbered close to 3,000, hadn't intervened when the incident had become serious. King Mohammed VI extended his condolences to the victims' families and offered to pay for funeral and hospital costs. Number 8. Chris Ojeda In June of 2018, New Jersey man Chris Ojeda invited friends and relatives to his Somerset home for a triple celebration that included his birthday, Father's Day and a gender reveal for his unborn child. A stunt regarding the latter involved 34-year-old Ojeda kicking a football filled with dye that was meant to reveal if he was going to have a boy or a girl. The guests had gathered in the garden and began filming the stunt. With a beer in one hand and sunglasses on his eyes, Ojeda kicked off his flip-flops and stepped up to the ball. He struck it and a pink cloud of smoke filled the air as guests exclaimed, It's a girl! The celebratory atmosphere lasted but a moment as after kicking the ball, Ojeda slipped and fell backwards on his foot, which bent at an awkward angle. He was left writhing in agony on the ground as his pregnant wife and other guests rushed to his aid. Ojeda, who'd heard several crunching sounds as he landed on his kicking foot, was helped to a chair and the pain he experienced reportedly got so intense that his vision became blurry. His wife took him to the hospital where doctors would tell him that he'd broken his ankle. Ojeda, who'd come up with the idea for the gender reveal, was forced to stay off his injured leg for several weeks. Number 7. Texas Plane Crash On September the 7th of 2019, a plane crashed in Turkey, Texas, while the pilot was carrying out an elaborate stunt as part of a gender reveal for a friend. The identities of those involved haven't been disclosed, but the aircraft was owned and operated by Horan Spraying Service, a crop dusting business based in Plainview. The one-seat plane was flying at a low altitude and stalled, following the release of about 350 gallons of pink water. It crashed into the ground, sustained considerable damage, and came to a stop inverted. Fortunately, the pilot and passenger survived the crash with minor injuries. There were no prior mechanical faults with the plane and a National Transportation Safety Board report concluded that the aircraft simply got too slow and unbalanced following the water discharge. Number 6. Pamela Crimea 56-year-old Pamela Crimea died in October of 2019 after being hit with shrapnel from an explosion involving an improvised device meant to be used during a gender reveal. The party was held at Crimea's residence in Marion County, Iowa, for her son Brad and his girlfriend, Kirsty Rankin. The family had placed colored powder along with gunpowder into a metal tube that was welded to a metal base. A piece of wood separated the two powders and the hole had been drilled into the side of the tube 
for a fuse. The family expected that their improvised stand would function like a cannon, with the gunpowder ignited and pushing the die through the top of the tube, which had been covered with tape. They'd hoped to post the reveal on social media for other loved ones to see. The party took a tragic turn as the contraption ended up functioning like a pipe bomb. The blast obliterated the tube and base, sending metal fragments flying at great speed. One of the shards struck Crimea in the head, even though she was 45 feet from the blast zone. She died on the spot, and the projectile that hit her flew for another 144 yards before landing in a nearby field. Sheriff Jason Sandholt expressed his condolences to the family, but also offered the incident as a reminder to members of the public of how dangerous homemade explosives can be. Number 5. Autumn Garrett On July the 8th of 2017, a mass shooting occurred at a house in Coleraine, Ohio, during a gender reveal party held for 21-year-old Cheyenne Willis. About a dozen guests had stayed into the night to watch a Spider-Man movie. At around 11 p.m., two gunmen burst into the capstan drive home and opened fire on those inside. At least 14 bullets flew through the living room. Before the attackers fled, eight people and a dog were injured while Willis's cousin, 22-year-old Autumn Garrett, was shot dead. Willis was shot in the thigh and, in the aftermath, reported that she'd suffered a miscarriage. The authorities would face difficulty in piecing together the context and circumstances surrounding the shooting, as many witnesses had given them false leads. In fact, Willis would also reveal that in spite of her initial statements, she was never pregnant. It's unclear why she'd lied and held what was essentially a fake gender reveal party. Investigators connected a number of survivors to drug activity, but fatal victim Garrett, a young mother from Indiana and her husband, who was among those injured, didn't have such affiliations and were only guests. Law enforcement eventually found that Willis had been the target, but concluded that the gunman had opened fire with the intention of killing everyone inside. Willis had become the focus of a murder-for-hire plot orchestrated by Roshan Bishop, aged 28, who was already in custody on drug trafficking charges at the time of the shooting. He enlisted the help of a man named Vandell Slade, who produced two shooters for hire from Columbus. They were identified as James Eccles and Michael Sannon, both in their early 20s, and Slade had reportedly been the one to drive the shooters to the residence. All four men were charged in the aftermath of the shooting with murder and attempted murder. Prior to the attempt on her life, Willis had been the target of another violent attack. On Christmas Eve 2014, she was assaulted by another woman in a parking lot, and the attacker, who claimed Willis had stolen her car, wrote an explicit confirmation of the beatdown on her forehead in permanent marker. The altercation was filmed and the clip went viral, but the charges against the attacker were eventually dropped after Willis failed to show up for court. Number 4. Incendiary Burnout In 2019, law enforcement from Australia's Queensland state released drone footage of a vehicle that had erupted in flames as part of a warning against burnouts, an increasingly popular trend among people looking to make an impression with their gender reveal parties. The cars are rigged to emit clouds of either blue or pink smoke, but the stunts can often end in disaster. As demonstrated in the footage shared by the authorities, the incident had occurred on April the 18th of 2018. At first, the reveal had gone as planned, with guests celebrating as they filmed the car driving down the road engulfed in blue smoke. Shortly after coming to a stop, however, it caught fire, forcing the driver and other guests to flee for their lives. It kept burning in the middle of the road as thick smoke, which from blue had turned to black, rose into the air. A spokesman for the Queensland Police Service told the media that, as a result of the incident, a 29-year-old man was convicted of dangerous operation of a motor vehicle. Number 3. Christopher Peckney In February of 2021, expecting father Christopher Peckney from New York was killed in an explosion by a contraption he'd been building for the gender reveal of his unborn child. 28-year-old Peckney had been assembling the device, which reportedly contained a pipe in his garage alongside his brother, Michael. Both men were described by other family members as mechanically gifted. The nature of the gender reveal invention wasn't specified by the authorities, but some have speculated that in trying to build a device that would release smoke or fireworks, Peckney had inadvertently created a pipe bomb. The police, responding to reports of an explosion, arrived at the residence in the Catskills town of Liberty. 
The blast had killed Peckney instantly and injured Michael, who was rushed to the hospital and treated for severe injuries to his legs, with medical staff essentially having to rebuild one of his knees. Number 2. Gender Reveal in Philadelphia In 2018, a video started circulating on YouTube of a gender reveal party that went wrong in Philadelphia. The clip was even featured on the New York Post's channel, but the identities of those involved weren't made public. An expecting couple lit the fuse and some firework tubes with the color of the pyrotechnics expected to indicate the gender of their unborn child. Some commenters were quick to point out the couple's poor decision-making as they'd chosen to set the fireworks off from a wobbly clothes rack. Soon enough, several were launched into the sky, but the tremor from their ignition had caused others to topple over from their unsteady support. Panicked screaming erupted as the pyrotechnics started flying into the partygoers. The footage would show several of them, including the camera handler, fleeing in an effort to escape the barrage of hot sparks. Fortunately, none of the children in attendance were hurt and only a few adults suffered minor burns. Number 1. Sawmill Fire In April of 2017, a wildfire burned through nearly 47,000 acres in the state of Arizona and its origin was traced to a gender reveal stunt. While not the only massive blaze linked to such a party, the sawmill fire as it came to be known is believed to have been the first. On April the 23rd, as part of the gender reveal celebrations, off-duty US Border Patrol agent Dennis Dickey shot at a target packed with a highly explosive substance called Tannerite in the Coronado State Forest. He missed the first few times but hit it on the fourth shot, triggering blue smoke and a fireball. The surrounding grass was instantly ignited and Dickey reportedly tried to put it out but couldn't because of how rapidly the blaze was spreading. He contacted the authorities and cooperated with them after taking responsibility for the fire. Conditions of unusually low precipitation for the region and winds of up to 40 miles per hour contributed to its rapid expansion. The fire burned for 11 days and ravaged terrain in spite of initial interventions from five air tankers and three helicopters carrying water. Containing and extinguishing it took the combined efforts of over 800 personnel from local, state and federal agencies. No one was hurt and no buildings were damaged, but suppressing the sawmill fire cost an estimated $8.2 million. Dickey pleaded guilty to the charge of starting a fire without a permit. He was sentenced to five years probation and ordered to pay $200,000 in restitution. In November of 2018, under the Freedom of Information Act, the Arizona Daily Star obtained the initial video of Dickey shooting the explosive target. The footage circulated and was mocked by online users some of whom also ridicule the concept of gender reveal parties. Number 10. Jade Harrison On October the 7th of 2019, a young British woman suffered severe injuries after she was flung from a ride at the Hull Fear, one of Europe's largest and oldest traveling fun fears. 21-year-old Jade Harrison was on the Air Max 360 ride when it started to bounce and tilt. She was flung from her seat like a rag doll and into the barrier. A teenage boy sustained minor injuries as Harrison struck him when she fell. Harrison was rushed to the hospital with broken teeth and a fractured jaw which required surgery. The woman was unable to smile as metal plates were inserted into her face. She also struggled to walk due to extensive bruising and nerve damage in her leg. Harrison would suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder and had to undergo cognitive behavioral therapy as part of her recovery. The ride's operators admitted liability and paid for Harrison's treatment. More than a year from the accident, she still had trouble eating hard foods, experienced partial loss of feeling in her leg, and got jittery whenever she was in a moving vehicle or heard loud noises. Number 9. Matt Landon In 2014, teenager Matt Landon was on a ride called Skyfire at the Colorado State Fair alongside his sister, 22-year-old Tawny Martinez. The ride swung riders upside down and held them in that position for several seconds before dropping them. The first time that Landon became inverted, his shoulder harness snapped, forcing the teen to hang on for his life. Martinez, who was still strapped in, captured the incident on her phone. As the ride swung back down, Landon felt his shoulder pop, but fortunately suffered no further injuries. It would later be determined that he'd torn multiple shoulder muscles. The attraction's operators blamed a faulty latch and claimed they'd fix it, while Landon told a media outlet 
I'm not riding any ride ever. Number 8. Cool Patch Pumpkins Corn Maze A number of fairs feature corn mazes, popular tourist attractions that have been cut out of cornfields in North America since the early 1980s. The Guinness Book of Records attributed the title of largest corn maze in 2014 to the one created by Cool Patch Pumpkins in Dixon, California. That year, the maze measured over 60 acres with hundreds of dead ends. To put that tremendous size into perspective, it covers a surface area larger than the US Capitol or New York City's Grand Central Station. However, according to Matt Cooley, who was running the maze, it had potentially grown to dangerous proportions. There had been instances in the past of people passing out while looking for the exit, but none were reported in serious condition. However, the same year that the maze achieved world record status, a number of 911 calls had been placed by visitors in need of rescue. One reported being lost in a maze for four hours. Another was worried that they'd be left in the maze overnight, as the 10 p.m. closing time was approaching and they still hadn't found their way out. In light of these issues, Cool Patch Pumpkins decided to reduce the size of the maze in its future iterations. Number 7. Chuang Chu Kit In September of 2017, a Hong Kong student was part of a group given early access to attractions that were going to be part of a Halloween-themed fair at Ocean Park. One of them was called Buried Alive and, according to the website, offered visitors to experience being buried alive alone before fighting their way out of their dark and eerie grave. At one point, those entering the haunted house attraction would go down slides in coffins. 21-year-old Chuan Chu Kit left the coffin and walked towards the exit. Unfortunately, one of the actors meant to guide him on the correct route was standing behind a curtain and didn't see him. Another actor had spotted Chuen going the wrong way but mistook him for a staff member because he was wearing black. The student ended up at the bottom of another movable slide and was crushed by an incoming coffin. Chuen struggled to breathe as he was pinned under its weight and ultimately suffocated. He was taken to a hospital where he was pronounced dead and the haunted house was closed pending an investigation. Number 6. Unnamed Carnival Worker in 2018, a carnival worker fell to his death while inspecting a ride at the Kiwanis Club Fair in Alexander City, Alabama. Only identified as a 45-year-old man originally from Belarus, the worker was asked to inspect a wheel situated at an estimated 30 feet on the Ring of Fire ride. The towering attraction turned riders upside down by hurling them around a central loop. It had a daily maintenance checklist that operators needed to go through before allowing fear goers on it. However, the Ring of Fire wasn't the ride normally assigned to the Belarusian worker, so when the designated inspector arrived at the scene, he was asked to climb back down. It was at that moment that he slipped and plummeted to the ground. He sustained critical injuries from which he passed away soon after. The fear and the ride he'd been inspecting reportedly remained open in the aftermath of his demise. Number 5. Ride Collapse in Xiaoyang County 16 people were hurt in February of 2021 following the collapse of a ride at a fair in Xiaoyang County, central China. Those who'd queued up for the ride heard the malfunction alarm while the flying chairs were still swinging in the air. The ride gathered speed before suddenly tilting over. Viral footage circulated online showed the terrifying moment that the chairs got progressively closer to the ground before crashing into it. Most of those injured were bystanders, three of whom were taken to the hospital in critical condition. The incident would later be described as a mechanical glitch, even though the ride had been inspected and declared safe roughly a month prior. The fear was closed down and several of the ride's operators were detained for questioning by the authorities. Reactions condemning the incident and lack of proper safety regulation were plentiful on the country's Weibo social media site. Number 4. John Weed In the fall of 2019, John Weed was one of the visitors at the Great Frederick Fair in Maryland. 59-year-old Weed was enjoying the fair's amenities when he was approached by two teenage brothers and their friends. They asked him for money, but Weed refused to give them any. The group kept badgering Weed while his family members pleaded with them to leave him alone. They appeared to walk away, but as Weed turned around, a 16-year-old boy punched him in the back of the head. As he turned around to face his attacker, the teen's younger brother, age 15, ran at Weed and struck him in the head. The punch was delivered with such force that the man lost consciousness almost immediately. The second blow proved fatal, 
as Weed passed away from massive head trauma. Prosecutors argued that the teens should be tried as adults, but after a lengthy hearing in February of 2020, the court determined that they were to remain in the juvenile system. Number 3. Missouri State Fear Race Car Crashes In August of 2012, the Missouri State Fear featured a charity race meant to raise money for the Special Olympics. The vehicles involved in the race were old police cars. Earlier in the evening, a 15-year-old driver whose name wasn't released lost control of his vehicle while going around a bend. His car overturned several times and the teen subsequently had to be airlifted to a local hospital. Then at around 9 p.m., 25-year-old off-duty officer Tyson Russell was also involved in an accident after the race car he was driving careered off track. It flew over a guardrail, through a safety fence and into spectators who'd gathered to watch the race. Russell wasn't hurt but five people sustained various injuries, two of whom were in serious condition. The victims, aged from 27 to 67, were hospitalized. According to a highway patrol spokesperson, one of them sustained a broken leg that potentially required amputation. The police claimed they wouldn't be investigating the crashes because they occurred during a private function. Number 2. He On February the 15th of 2016, a young man died at a temple fair in China's Urbei province after getting crushed by machinery. The 19-year-old victim, identified as Yi by his surname, was on the pirate ship attraction at the fairgrounds. According to witnesses, E was very excited and stood up from his seat. Unfortunately, he lost his grip and fell forward. The teenager was crushed as his body was dragged under the mechanical workings of the ride. Staff pulled him out and paramedics tried to resuscitate him, but it was to no avail. He was pronounced dead at the scene. An investigation was launched to determine if alcohol or other substances had played a role in the teen's behavior on the pirate ship. A confirmation in that regard would partially place responsibility on the ride's operators for allowing E to be on it while intoxicated. Number 1. Gillingham Fair Disaster In the 1920s, every summer, a fair was organized at Gillingham Park in Kent, England, with the aim of raising funds for a local hospital. The festivities would typically conclude with a demonstration by the Gillingham Fire Brigade. Considered the highlight of the fair, a three-story house was built out of wooden canvas. A mock wedding was put together inside in which two firefighters acting as bride and groom would entertain various guests. Then, a fire emergency was simulated with the use of smoke bombs and flares, requiring the building's occupants to be rescued from the upper levels. Once everyone was out, a real fire was started, enabling the fire brigade to demonstrate their skills. In July of 1929, however, as those inside were preparing to carry out the staged rescue, the real fire was lit. The cause of the confusion remains unknown. The blaze rapidly overtook the building, trapping people inside. The fire brigade knew right away that they were dealing with a real emergency, but the crowd mistook the screams and cries for help as acting. They cheered and applauded what they believed to be a realistic performance, accompanied by spectacular effects. It was only after they witnessed two people with burning clothes jumping from atop the building that the tragic reality was made clear. Thirteen people died at the scene and two more succumbed to their injuries at the very hospital for which the fear had been organized. Number 10. December 26, 2016 Prior to her birthday, the parents of Ruby Ibarra Garcia accidentally posted a public invitation for everyone to attend her 15th party. Held in La Jolla community in central Mexico, a horse race was to be put on in her honor with the winner taking away a grand prize of 10,000 pesos or about $490. The invitation went viral on social media and thousands of people turned up to help her celebrate her special day and partake in the race. 66-year-old Felix Peña was one attendee that hoped to walk away a winner. A local stable worker, Peña, regularly raced horses and had entered his own horse, Oso Domido, into the event. As he stood cheering on, he somehow stepped into the path of a galloping horse and was trampled. Some eyewitnesses speculated that he might have misjudged the distance and speed of the oncoming horse, but it's still unclear what had led the experienced horseman into its path. Benya was rushed to a hospital but died on the way. When asked about the party, police said that, apart from his accident, it had gone on peacefully. Number 9. 22nd of May, 2021 Stephen Anderson and his family traveled for a weekend getaway to Center Hill Lake, Tennessee, with two other couples to celebrate his birthday. Unfortunately, the celebrations were abruptly cut short on Saturday. 
Whilst enjoying a day at the lake, the father of two fell from a rock bluff and died. He had decided to scale the rocks to gain a better vantage point from which to jump into the lake. But as he was climbing, he lost his footing. He was seen hitting rock after rock as he tumbled down the cliff and into the water. The recovery process required the collaboration of many, but his body was finally found and recovered with the use of a remote aquatic robot 165 feet below the surface. Number 8. 22nd of May, 2021. Another person tragically fell to their death at a birthday party also on May the 22nd of 2021. 24-year-old investment firm employee Cameron Pirelli was attending a rooftop party in Manhattan's East Village when she slipped and fell between two buildings. It was reported that she'd been trying to climb between two rooftops and was attempting to use an air conditioning vent when she slipped. She fell at around 3 a.m. on Saturday morning and was taken to a local hospital where she was declared dead. Authorities didn't suspect foul play, but Pirelli's family was left confused as she'd never been one to take risks. Her death prompted officials to call for a crackdown on a string of weakly overcrowded and noisy rooftop parties reported in the area. Two gunmen forced their way into a children's birthday party at a motel in Santee, South Carolina, in what was deemed as an attempted robbery. The armed robbers forced the two adults, three children and one infant in attendance into a corner and demanded that the father of the birthday girl give them his property. The man was about to begin cutting his daughter's birthday cake when the two party crashers barged in, brandishing guns. According to reports, the gunman fired shots outside the room and he even held up a seven-year-old child at gunpoint as a means of scaring the victims. Once the robbers got what they wanted, they made a quick getaway in a woman's car but were caught soon after. Police identified the perpetrators as Santee locals, 24-year-old Alexander Outlaw and 17-year-old Rufus Gates. Outlaw was charged with six counts of kidnapping, first-degree burglary and possession of a weapon during a violent crime and was given a 10-year sentence. Gates faced multiple charges of kidnapping, armed robbery and possession of a weapon, but the charges were dropped. Still a minor, Gates pleaded guilty to second-degree robbery and was sentenced to a maximum of five years under the Youthful Offenders Act. Police identified the getaway car and the driver pled guilty to misprison of a felony, but the judge dropped her five-year sentence to one year on probation. Number 5. July 28, 2019 Fit and healthy Cambridge University graduate Dominic Hamlin unexpectedly died at his brother's birthday party while performing a party trick he'd practiced since childhood. It was more of a challenge in which opponents would swim as many lengths of the pool as they could underwater before they had to rise to the surface to take a breath. Hamlin had swum about two and a half lengths when he became unresponsive and stopped moving. His unconscious body was pulled from the water within seconds and his father, a neurosurgeon, began to give him emergency treatment until paramedics arrived. Despite the quick response, doctors were not able to save him and he died in a hospital 15 hours later. In the past, Hamlin was known to reach five or six lengths before needing to take a breath. The official cause of death was acute cardiac arrhythmia, but doctors stated they could only speculate on the underlying cause to which his death could be attributed. Number 4. May 30th, 2020 Ryan Farrell rented a high-rise apartment building in Melbourne to celebrate his girlfriend's birthday, but left in handcuffs after stabbing and killing his childhood best friend, Liam Cahill. A few hours into the party, Cahill had an altercation with another guest and Farrell promptly asked him to leave. Offended that he was the one being kicked out, a fight broke out between the friends. During the brawl, Farrell grabbed a kitchen knife and plunged it through Cahill's chest. The victim stumbled into the hallway before collapsing and dying. Farrell, upon finding his body, pleaded with him to wake up, but then chose to flee by scaling the apartment building and breaking into another flat. He was spotted by police at the bottom and he was taken into custody. In court, Farrell insisted that Cahill had punched him first and had him backed into a corner. Nonetheless, Farrell said he was consumed with guilt and regret. He pled guilty to manslaughter. Cahill and Farrell had grown up side by side since primary school and were both studying as apprentice plumbers. Cahill's father condemned it as a despicable act of betrayal and vowed he'd never forgive Farrell. Number 3. 28th of February 2020 Russian influencer Ekaterina Didenko's birthday party in February of 2020 turned to tragedy when a stunt involving dry ice went wrong. The famous blogger and her husband had been hosting friends at a Moscow pool complex to celebrate her 29th when over 55 pounds of dry ice 
were thrown into a swimming pool. It was intended to create a dramatic visual effect to impress guests, but instead sent seven people to the hospital and killed three. When added to the pool, the frozen carbon dioxide created a thick toxic vapor that caused acute carbon dioxide poisoning and chemical burns to partygoers in the pool. Didenko's husband was amongst those taken to the hospital, but his injuries proved too severe and he was pronounced dead shortly after. While at the hospital, Didenko posted multiple videos to her 1 million subscribers, updating them on her state and breaking the news about her husband. As her following began to grow in the aftermath, she continued to post videos documented her grief, for which she was branded immoral. Prior to the tragedy as a trained pharmacist, Didenko dedicated her page to sharing advice about at-home medicine, along with glimpses into her personal life. Number 2. December 24, 2019 Caroli Dawn Taylor's uncle was hosting her 46th birthday party at his house in Harris County, Texas, when her violent ex-boyfriend, Albert Benjamin Simon, turned up and demanded to see her. Taylor's uncle had watched Simon pull up in front of his house just before 9pm and recognizing who he was, walked out to meet him. Simon in turn met him with the barrel of a gun, pointed at his chest and forced his way into the party. Moments after the final notes of happy birthday rang out, brandishing two guns, he took Taylor outside onto the porch and threatened to kill her if any party goers called the police. Shortly after, multiple gunshots echoed out and Taylor's uncle is said to have found her dead with five gunshot wounds to her head and body. Simon fled the scene and was missing for several days, during which he apparently sought out a friend to hide his car and confessed to the murder. Four days after the shooting, Simon was located sitting on a bench in Herman Park. The altercation that followed led a deputy to open fire on the hostile suspect, hitting him at least two times. He was rushed to the closest hospital but succumbed to his injuries. Number 1. October 6, 2018 18 people were riding in a 2011 Ford Excursion limousine on the afternoon of October 6, 2018, when it crashed in Skohari, New York. The group had gathered to celebrate the birthday of Amy Steenberg and was made up of her newlywed husband as well as her closest friends and relatives. The limousine was on the way to the birthday venue at a local brewery when it blew through an intersection, crashed into a parked car and went flying into a ravine. Along with the death of the driver and all 17 passengers, two nearby pedestrians were struck and killed in the crash. Investigations into the tragedy found fault in the vehicle, the driver and the company. The limousine had failed two mechanical inspections for deficient brakes and been ordered out of service by the state. Furthermore, the vehicle was only certified to take 10 of the 17 passengers and the driver was licensed to take less than 15. The owner and operator, Nauman Hussein, was arrested and charged for criminally negligent homicide and second-degree manslaughter. He fought the accusation by stating the brake failure was unforeseen and that the owner should be on the fraudulent shop they had hired to fix the brakes. The limousine crash made history as the deadliest US transportation accident in nine years. Number 8. Easter Egg Hunt in Somerset In April of 2012, roughly 25 children and their parents were at an Easter Egg Hunt near Woodland at Holford, Somerset. At some point during the event, engineering consultant Stuart Moffat, aged 34, had spotted a three-year-old boy standing on a brown egg-shaped object about four inches high. Moffat, who was at the egg hunt with his wife and three children, soon came to the shocking realization that the object beneath the child was a hand grenade. The man would later tell a media outlet that the boy had thought it was a rock. Moffat alerted organizers of the Stowey Bears preschool group, who contacted the authorities and began slowly moving children away from the scene. The area was cordoned off and a team from the Army's Explosive Ordnance Disposal destroyed the live grenade in a controlled explosion. During World War II, there used to be an American Army base in Holford and the grenade was believed to have been a relic from that period. Number 7. Dimitri Harrell on Easter morning 2015, a man killed his fiancée at their Minnesota home, allegedly following a row about his infidelity. The argument had erupted at around 3.30 a.m. between Dimitri Harrell and Samiria White, aged 21 and 19 respectively, in the bedroom of their St. Paul apartment. Harrell would later admit to the authorities 
that he stored his handgun underneath the mattress of his and White's three-month-old daughter, Demiria. He was holding the child in his arms when he pointed the weapon at his fiance and shot her in the face at point-blank range. When paramedics arrived at the scene, there was nothing more they could do but declare White dead. A bullet had entered the lower side of her face, went through her head and exited behind her right ear. It later emerged that White and Harrell had been having troubles in their relationship which were allegedly exacerbated by the fact that he'd fathered another child with a different woman. Sources reported that she'd intended to break up with him because of his repeated infidelity. White's 16-year-old brother was also at the residence on the night of the shooting, and he'd been awoken by the yelling. Before the gunshot rung out, he'd heard his sister tell Harrell, don't point that gun at me, to which he'd allegedly responded by telling her to shut up. Harrell initially maintained that he'd accidentally discharged the weapon, while trying to store it away but ultimately pleaded guilty to second-degree, intentional but not premeditated murder. He was sentenced to more than 30 years in prison. Number 6. Antoine MacDonald On Easter Sunday 2019, a man clad in a bunny suit jumped to the defense of a woman as she was involved in a physical altercation outside the SAC Comedy Lab in Orlando, Florida. The brawl had reportedly erupted after a man had without provocation, spat on a female victim. 20-year-old Anton MacDonald, who was dressed as the Easter Bunny, intervened and pulled the man off her before throwing haymakers at his head. The incident was captured by a witness in a cell phone video which went viral and some were heard egging on the Easter Bunny. An Orlando police officer who had been patrolling the area broke up the fight and none of those involved, including the Easter Bunny-clad MacDonald, were arrested. In the altercation's immediate aftermath, Footage also showed MacDonald, who was presumably still hopped up on adrenaline, bouncing around and throwing shadow punches to a soundtrack of cheers and laughter. He was hailed as a hero by multiple media outlets and tried to capitalize on the attention by documenting his interviews through an Instagram account captioning posts as Bad Bunny or Hero Bunny. However, it subsequently emerged that at the time of his Good Samaritan intervention, MacDonald still had an open criminal warrant for burglary in New Jersey and that he'd been accused of armed robbery in Delaware in 2017. It's unclear how his previous legal troubles were resolved, but on January the 16th of 2020, Floridian authorities arrested McDonald in Seminole County. He was suspected to have recently run a stop sign and crashed his motorcycle into a carport in Altamonte Springs. The carport collapsed, damaging a vehicle, and a witness told the police they'd seen McDonald limping away. Upon arriving at his residence, troopers noticed an SUV pulling away from the property. They stopped it and found McDonald lying down in the back seat in the Easter Bunny costume. A dashcam video would show the suit falling off him as troopers pulled him up. While handcuffed in the back of the police car, McDonald told the troopers, Sir, you're arresting me in a bunny suit? Do your research, Orlando Easter Bunny. He then asked for an ambulance and paramedics tended to his injuries, a leg abrasion and a rib laceration, which the police determined were consistent with a crash. Number 5. Jalicia Jennings On April the 4th of 2021, a woman was gunned down in Shreveport, Louisiana, following what was reported to have been a fight with another woman. In the weeks that followed the incident, Charles Coons and Jasmine Fox, both in their early 30s, were arrested and charged with second-degree murder, while 31-year-old Andrea Mitchell was charged with being an accessory after the fact. As detailed by the Shreveport Police Department, the trio had been connected to the fatal shooting of Jalisha Jennings, a 30-year-old mother of nine, on the evening of Easter Sunday in a crowded parking lot on Hearn Avenue. Jennings was said to have gotten in a fight with another woman, possibly Fox, when a man intervened and opened fire. Jennings succumbed to gunshot wounds she'd sustained to her leg and chest. A video of the fight that was subsequently disseminated online showed that there were many witnesses at the scene, including children, but the authorities had initially faced difficulty in identifying suspects. On April 21st, Combs and Mitchell were arrested in Fort Worth, Texas and extradited back to Louisiana, while Fox surrendered herself to the authorities two days later. Number 4. Venetia Stain in 2021, on Easter Sunday, 24-year-old Venetia Stain was visiting family in Gracie Rock Village in the Central American coastal country of Belize. There would reportedly always been tension between Stain and her brother's common-law wife, Leanne Davis, aged 25. During what was meant to be a peaceful family gathering, an argument broke out between the two women. It rapidly escalated into a fight during the course of which Davis grabbed a 10-inch kitchen knife 
Before other family members could intervene, Davis plunged a blade into Stane's neck. She was transported from the village over a bordering river via canoe and taken to the Carl Huesner Memorial Hospital. By then, the young woman had experienced critical blood loss and was pronounced dead on arrival. Davis was subsequently remanded to the Belize Central Prison after being arraigned for a single count of murder. Number 3. Brianna Navarro On Easter Sunday, 2021, in the afternoon, a young woman was shot and killed in Houston, Texas, after her boyfriend had gotten into a fight at a local convenience store. 22-year-old Brianna Navarro's partner had driven away after the initial altercation with the woman in the front passenger seat. They were followed by a group of men that included 21-year-old Derek Dwayne Small. It's unclear if he'd been the one directly involved in the fight, but a vehicle with him in it then rear-ended the car occupied by Navarro, her boyfriend, and her two-year-old son. From the second vehicle, Small then opened fire and Navarro, who was six months pregnant at the time, was struck in the back. The woman's boyfriend and her son were unharmed and the former pulled over for assistance as he spotted Houston Fire Department paramedics at the intersection of Wilcrest Drive and Richmond Avenue. Navarro was pronounced dead while Small was later arrested and charged with murder and aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Number 2. Rashad Riddle After Easter service in 2013, Rashad Riddle, aged 25, approached the Hiawatha Church of God in Christ in Ashtabula, Ohio. Armed with a handgun, he then shot his father, 52-year-old Richard, who had been attending the service and the wound he inflicted was immediately fatal. As reported by Associate Pastor Sean Adams, Riddle continued walking into the church and yelled that the killing had been the will of Allah. Chaos ensued in the aftermath as the dozens of worshippers inside the church had begun screaming, trying to find shelter and calling 911. Police officers arrived within moments of Riddle opening fire, guided by the belief that because of the highly public nature of the incident, a mass shooting had occurred. They quickly subdued Riddle, whom they subsequently described as cooperative. In the days that followed, Ashtabula police chief Robert Stell reported that Riddle had offered no motive for the killing aside from his initial statement that God had willed it. The targeted shooting had come as a surprise, considering that he wasn't known to have had a difficult relationship with his father. Nevertheless, Riddle had an extensive criminal record and a well-documented history of violence. In 2006, he was arrested and charged with two counts of felonious assault, kidnapping, abduction, and tampering with evidence. One of the assault charges stemmed from an incident when he'd allegedly attempted to slash his girlfriend's throat. The young woman had been cut with the knife in addition to suffering bruising on her side and chest. For the murder of his father in April of 2016, Ashtabula County Judge Ronald Vettel found Riddle not guilty by reason of insanity. Vettel quoted a psychologist's report which claimed that Riddle suffered from a severe mental illness and he was somewhat delusional and religiously preoccupied. He was sentenced to spend the rest of his life in a mental health facility. Number 1. Kasim Charles in March of 2016, a man dressed as the Easter Bunny was captured by surveillance and cell phone cameras brawling with another man at Newport Center Mall in Jersey City, New Jersey. As reported by local authorities, the row began after a one-year-old child had slipped from a chair while taking pictures with the costumed character. The toddler was unhurt, but the incident triggered a physical altercation between her father, 44-year-old Juan Jimenez Guerrero, and the man wearing the costume, the latter identified as Kasim Charles, aged 22, was seen in a first video which was uploaded to Twitter, biting with the other man. More security and bystanders intervened, prompting the Easter Bunny-clad man to retreat. Within seconds, Charles returned, ripped off his bunny gloves and started swinging once more. A second video would show the altercation devolve into a larger brawl with several people punching and kicking Charles. The fight was ultimately dispersed and he was detained by the mall security staff. Both he and Jimenez Guerrero were booked into Hudson County Correctional Center on charges of aggravated assault and disorderly conduct. Thanks for watching. Would you rather be attacked by 100 rabid rabbits or by one mutant person-sized rabbit? Let us know in the comments section below.